string of talks, uh, starting with Simon Dew from uh, University of Washington. He's going to talk to us about uh, offline uh, and two player zero sum mark of games. Uh, Simon, take it away. All right, I will be thanks. The, yeah, the chat for questions. All right. uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here talking about our. Uh, recent work on the offline multi-agent reinforced learning. Um, this is a joint work with my student, Steven Tui from uh, UW. Uh, so today we're going to talk about two player zero sum Markov games. So uh, because this is a multi-agent reinforced learning workshop, so I don't think I need to motivate this problem. So, you know, basically this problem talk about um, two players compete against each other and uh, each has a strategy. And our goal is to find an actual equilibrium, which is a pair of uh, strategies that no player can do better by unilaterally changing the policy. And uh, for this problem, there are many applications like poker, Go, chess, those games, uh, and also some in, uh, investment as well. So this is the standard uh, two players are some Markov games. So today um, I'm going to talk about uh, the offline setting of this two player zero sum game. Um, so in the online setting, usually we can control an agent, uh, which is uh, interacting with the environment. And uh, based on the collected data, this agent can update its policy. Now this often represented by some neural networks. So this is the online setting. Uh, for the offline reinforcement learning setting, um, we are given a big data set, which are uh, it's collected from the past interactions using some policies or sometimes even a set of policies. Um, and then uh, we just use this big data set to train the policy and we hope that this learned policy uh, give good performance when we deploy it, okay? Uh, so the motivation for the offline reinforced learning is that in many settings, uh, real world applications, uh, you know, online interaction with environment can be very costly. Uh, so we really want to use existing data to learn good policy. Um, so this talk will be focusing on uh, learning and Nash equilibrium in this offline um, two players or some Markov games. And we will focus on what are the conditions we need to have in order to learn a Nash equilibrium. So before getting into the two players or some setting, uh, let me first review a little bit on uh, what we know about offline single agent reinforced learning. So, uh, so here's a quick review of what is single agent reinforced learning. Here we are controlling an agent, uh, which is interacting with an environment. At each time step, uh, the agent is at some state that's called ST. And uh, the agent takes some actions, AT. Uh, the agent receives some reward based on some reward function that depends on state and action. And the state or the environment transits the agent to the next state according to some transition probability, uh, which may depend on the time step, uh, which I did known as PT here, and moves to the next state as T plus one. Okay. And here, let's say we consider the episode exciting. So for each episode, you have um, a planning horizon or the episode length H. So basically this kind of interaction repeat for H times. So this is a single agent reinforced learning. Um, and the goal of single agent learning is to learn good policy, uh, or you can view policy as a mapping from state to action, basically tells you which action to choose based on the current state you're at. Um, and the goal is to maximize the total expected total reward or the value function, um, which is defined this way with the expectation or the policy and the transition, uh, say starting from a fixed state, uh, let's say S1. And in terms of a learning problem, uh, want to learn a policy that is close to the optimal uh, policy, uh, uh, which is measured by the difference of the value in terms of the uh, this policy and the open policy. Okay, so this is a standard single agent reinforced learning. Um, and here, let's say we consider this most basic setting, the tabular setting, where we have finite state, uh, finite actions, and let's say reward scaling is from zero to one. And in this case, the sample complexity uh, will depend uh, polynomially on these factors, S A H and the one or epsilon. Okay, so this is a single agent reinforcement learning. And for the offline setting, um, 
this is the offline single agent reinforcement. Basically, we have, uh, say, n um, trajectories. Each trajectory has, uh, in total, h uh, steps. For each step, we have a data set of, uh, of this form. Say we have current state, action, reward, next state. And um, uh, the key notion in this uh, single agent reinforced learning or offline reinforced learning is that uh, we say that this data set is collected from a distribution, uh, which we denote as D rho, where rho is uh, the data collection or the behavior policy. So we use this policy um, to collect data, okay? And uh, you can think of this policy as a, even as a mixed policy with different, uh, you know, fixed policies. And this is like a mixture of policies as well. So basically what we care about is this distribution zero that generates um, this data set, okay? So this zero, it's a state action distribution that depends on uh, the uh, policy zero and uh, uh, this uh, MDP transition uh, matrix P, okay? And again, the goal is the same. We want to learn a policy from this data set uh, without any action with the environment such that the policy is near optimal, say within epsilon uh, arrow um, to the optimal policy, okay? So uh, different from the online setting, the natural question for the offline setting is that what kind of assumption we need to make on this distribution that generates data uh, under which we can learn a new policy. So a simple thought experience is that you can think of if the open policy can visit some state uh, and actions, but our data collection policies uh, does not uh, visit those state action. For that case, you cannot hope to you know, learn a good policy or learn your open policy because you don't have the coverage over uh, some state action that are visited by the open policy, but here in your data set, you don't have any information about those uh, state and actions, okay? So there's a long line of work on single agent uh, offline reinforcement learning, and uh, researchers have identified this assumption. It's called single policy coverage assumption, uh, which is shown to have a, be both necessary and sufficient. So uh, first of all, it cannot be weakened because if you do have some uh, state actions that is um, so here, by definition, uh, the definition of single policy assumption is that uh, the behavior policy only covers a single open policy. So uh, this is necessary because uh, if you have some state action that is not visited or not uh, collected by your uh, behavior or data collection policy, then you cannot hope for to learn a new open policy. On the other hand, uh, this is also sufficient because uh, we do have some algorithm based on pessimism uh, to learn with, say, polynomial number of samples. So formally, uh, this assumption states that there exists some constant, let's call it a C single, such that the kind of density ratio and its importance rate uh, between the distribution induced by the open policies, let's say pi star, uh, and this distribution induced by your behavior policy, so this importance rate, is upper bounded by um, this constant, say, say single, okay? Uh, there's some stronger assumption uh, people have made in previous work showing like you cover all state actions, but this is much uh, weaker because you only need to cover the state actions visited by the open policy, okay? And uh, in terms of the scaling, uh, the single can be uh, in the best case, it can be one. Uh, when say rho equals to pi star, then um, say single becomes one, but you know, it can also be infinity uh, if you do not have some, uh, have some state action that uh, you do not cover by this behavior policy. Okay, so sample convexity will eventually depend on this uh, concept. Okay, so in terms of algorithm, uh, there's a uh, ultimate idea called pessimism, which basically penalize the uncertain uh, policies so we would be a more conservative when choosing the uh, output policy. And uh, for this setting, there are also you know, optimal bounds and, um, uh, where scaling is S, uh, H cube, C single divided by epsilon square. Okay, so this is what we know about uh, single agent offline reinforcement learning. So this work, we studied the two player zero sum Markov games. Um, so the setting is similar. Um, 
So here uh, we are controlling, uh, there are two agents um, at each time step. They are all at uh, both at some state ST and they choose a pair of actions, AT and BT. So A is action for, we call max player. B is action for the mean player. Um, and then um, they receive some reward based on the state and this action pair. And the um, environment will transit these two players to the next state according to the transition function. And again, this repeat for H times H is a plan in horizon. So this is a zero sum game. So um, the max player uh, with a sequence of actions, A1 to H, they try, uh, this, per, uh, this player tries to maximize the expected total reward. And we also have a mean player which an action sequence B1 to BH, uh, who tries to minimize the uh, uh, expected total reward. So um, our key insight actually is just by studying a much simpler version of the uh, two player zero sum games, uh, Markov games, we call it zero sum bandit. Uh, basically it's a special case of zero sum Markov games. Uh, in the case that uh, H, equals one. So basically you don't need to do any planning. Uh, there's no transition at all. And uh, you have a fixed state. So S equals one, okay? So in this case, only the reward function matters. Basically uh, the max player want to try, uh, tries to find a, you know, action uh, such that can maximize the reward and uh, mean, uh, mean player tries to find minimum reward. Okay, so this is uh, the setting. Um, so again, we'll study the most basic tabular setting. Uh, we have finite number of states, finite number of actions for both players to rewards bounded by uh, one and um, some more complex will scale with these factors. Okay. Um, so in terms of the, uh, uh, we also need to introduce some notions in this uh, setting because it's a two player zero sum game. Um, so we have a policy pair, let's call it new and new. So the max player um, is playing this policy mu and mean player plays this policy nu. So generally these policies are stochastic policies uh, because uh, this is a two player game. Um, so it's a policy is a mapping from the state to a, a distribution over the actions. So similar to single agent setting, we can define the Q function, the value function where the Q function Given a set of uh, a pair of policies, mu and nu is defined as the um, uh, starting from state and a pair of actions, the uh, expected reward uh, from this time step uh, H, and then following the policy pair uh, mu and nu. And uh, for the value function, it is the um, expected reward from this uh, state S following this policy pair mu and nu. Um, so here we also need to define the best response and uh, for, for both max and mean players. So given a policy for the uh, max player, the best response uh, for this policy, it's a policy for the mean player uh, such that can minimize uh, this value function. Um, okay, so that's why it's called best response and notation we denoted as the uh, uh, V uh, mu star, which is the value of the best response for given policy of the max player. And also we can define the best response for the mean players um, by symmetry. Uh, so for uh, uh, mean player policy nu, the max uh, best response value uh, is V star nu, which is uh, value achieved by um, maximizing over the all policy of the max player for this given mean player's policy nu. Okay, so a Nash equilibrium, uh, say a mu star, nu star, satisfy that um, the nu star is basically the best response for mu star and mu star is the best response for nu star. It's a standard result in game theory. And uh, so we eventually want to output a pair of policies, say mu and nu, so we want to measure how good it is. Um, the measure we use is called the reality gap, which is the uh, uh, difference between the uh, best response values of the uh, mean player and the uh, max player. Okay, so this is the duality gap. And our goal is to find um, a pair of policies such that this gap is more than epsilon. Okay, 
So, okay, now let's study uh, what is the offline setting. So similar to a single agent setting, uh, we have a batch of data sample from some data collection policy pair. Okay, so now we have a pair of policies and um, so this, the, uh, so the pair we do known as the row and uh, this row will induce uh, distribution over the state and action pairs. Also, it depends on some transition P of the uh, um, this uh, environment. Okay, and goal is to learn a, a policy pair such that this gap is smaller than epsilon. Okay, so again, we first study uh, under what kind of condition about this distribution um, induced by the behavior policy uh, under which we can learn a near uh, Nash equilibrium. And the first thing you may think about is to uh, you know, generalize the idea in the single agent setting. Uh, in single agent setting, we know that you only need to cover the optimal policy and then it's enough to recover the uh, near optimal policy, okay? So here, can we do the same? Um, so you, uh, the analog is corresponding assumption is the following, that the density ratio or the importance weight between say, um, a pair of Nash equilibrium, mu star, V star, over this data collection uh, uh, policy, data distribution induced by this policy uh, is upper bounded by some constant, okay? So this is uh, uh, natural generalization of the single policy coverage in a single agent setting. Uh, so Simon, so, one question. Yeah. Uh, inside yeah. your, your capital D set, you meant to have A and B in there? Like, like ah, yes, sorry, this should be B. Yeah, so and, as so like, A, B, reward and next state. And both, so both players are observing the state, the two actions chosen. Right, right, so we, here we just consider, because we are in an offline setting, basically we can observe everything. Um, and uh, the data can be generated according to any policy. And uh, we study what kind of properties of this policy pair, uh, we can learn a good uh, Nash equilibrium. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, uh, so this should be, be here. Okay, uh, okay. so uh, first uh, let's study whether this condition is enough, like we only cover one Nash equilibrium. Uh, our first uh, result, and there's actually the key takeaway from this talk is that this is not possible. So we give a counter, very simple counter example showing um, this assumption alone is not uh, sufficient. So uh, here's our counter example. Uh, so let me dig into a bit detail. Uh, so basically you have two games, uh, one uh, and both games, uh, you have two actions for each player say uh, A1, B1, and uh, A1, A2, and B1, B2, okay? So, so the first game, if you play A1, B1, you get reward 0.5, A1, B2 get reward one, A2, B1, you get reward zero, and A2, B2 get reward uh, 0.5. So for this game, uh, the Nash equilibrium is just A1, B1, okay? Uh, we can check that very easily because at this point, uh, uh, there's no incentive for both players to change this action. And the second game, it's um, this one. So the only difference from the first game is that we change this A2, B2 to 0.5, okay? But this change also changes the Nash equilibrium. Uh, the Nash equilibrium for game two becomes A2, B2, okay? Again, you can check this by, there's just no incentive for both players to change this action, okay? So now let's consider the following setting. Uh, we, our data set covers uh, A1B1 and A2B2 uh, with equal probability, okay? So this data set consists of many A1B1, A2B2, and we observe this reward, okay? In this setting, we, this data set uh, does cover um, the Nash equilibrium uh, in, for both games, okay? And in this setting, the C single um, is two because um, it's visits, uh, use A1, B1, A2, B2 with equal probability, okay? However, the main problem uh, for this uh, example is that uh, with only with this data set, you cannot differentiate whether we are in game one or game two, right? Uh, because we can only observe that uh, you play A1, B1, you get 0.5 reward, you play A2, B2, you get 0.5 reward, and uh, basically you cannot differentiate these two. So this is basically like our counter example. It's very simple. It shows that if you only cover, you just only cover Nash equilibrium, uh, it's not enough to, uh, um, to learn uh, this Nash equilibrium, okay? 
Um, so basically the insight is that you do need some information about other uh, say action pairs in order to identify which is uh, um, Nash equilibrium. Okay, so what kind of assumption can we make? Can we, uh, so now we need a stronger assumption in order to learn the Nash equilibrium. So this is the assumption uh, we make. So this is a second takeaway, like uh, we believe this is a natural assumption. Um, okay, so let me first introduce this assumption. So uh, the assumption is following. So for Nash equilibrium, um, mu star, nu star, okay? We need a behavior policy that covers mu star nu for all nu and uh, mu uh, nu star for all mu, okay? So, uh, so this uh, table shows the intuition. So that, again, this A1, B1 is a Nash equilibrium. So we not only need to cover A1, B1, we also need to cover all the, uh, all A1, B1, A1, B2 to A1, say B, B, okay? So the entire row. Also, we need this entire column, say A1, B1, A2, B1 to A, A, uh, B1, okay? So this is um, uh, the unilateral coverage assumption we propose. So more formally, we assume that there exists some constant, say unilateral, such that the density ratio between uh, any uh, D mu star nu over D rho and D mu nu star and D rho uh, is upper bounded by this constant. And again, our sample complexity will depend on this constant. And this requires for every um, um, state action um, uh, pair and every policy pairs. So in this, I think you can see here, there's a difference between the two pairs of some game and um, single agent. For a single agent setting, the C single can be, and the best case can be one, but in this case, C unilateral um, is, um, in the best case, it can be just A or B because you need to cover the entire row and column. So in the uniform distribution case, it would be uh, A or B. And for the other uh, action pairs, you can cover them or not, doesn't matter. Um, but you know, if you cover some, then it will make your senior lateral uh, side bigger. Okay, so uh, we also show that, uh, I don't think I have time to go over this, but uh, you cannot really weaken this assumption. So again, we can propose some example that uh, if you only slightly violate this assumption, again, you have this identifiability issue that you cannot differentiate two games with different Nash equilibrium. So basically we show that uh, this assumption cannot be uh, weakened. All right, so now let's go to the algorithm. We show that under this unilateral uh, assumption, you can actually learn a Nash equilibrium. So for the bandit case, um, the algorithm idea is uh, uh, similar or, or it's natural extension of the uh, single agent setting. So we estimate each reward and then we obtain an upper bound and lower bound based on say, uh, whole thing bonds, things like that. And then uh, we compute uh, Nash equilibrium for uh, using the lower bond and we contain a pair of policies, uh, say mu underbar, nu underbar. And also we compute uh, uh, Nash equilibrium for the upper bound of this reward, say mu upper bar, nu upper bar. So this is an, Situation, so uh, we obtain the up like an uh, interval for the reward, confidence interval for the reward, and uh, we use upper bound to compute one Nash equilibrium, we use lower bound to compute Nash equilibrium. And here, our output is for the max player, is the um, policy corresponds to the lower bound of the reward, and our output for the min player is the uh, policy that corresponds to the upper bound of the uh, reward. So this represents um, the idea of uh, pessimism because um, we kind of penalize uncertain uh, uh, action pairs. So for both player, um, we use this pessimistic uh, policy to as our output. Okay, so this is our optimum idea. It's a kind of a natural extension of the single agent setting. And, um, for the result. Um, so with this unilateral coverage assumption, uh, we can have this kind of bond, like it's AB times C unilateral or epsilon square. 
Uh, if you have some stronger assumption about the coverage, that's called uniform coverage, which basically means that you cover the entire, all the uh, action pairs and you can prove to say unif, which is a constant for uh, this coverage assumption uh, or epsilon square. And for turn-based game, again, we can obtain a stronger uh, bond, which is C unilateral or epsilon square. So this results justify that this assumption is a sufficient assumption. And furthermore, as I showed before, uh, this assumption is cannot be weakened. So this is kind of a, a kind of a complete picture about um, this assumption. Uh, at, le at least this assumption cannot be weakened and it's also sufficient. And in terms of lower bound, um, we just inherited from the single agent setting uh, with this unilateral assumption, you can obtain a C unilateral or epsilon square sample complexity. So you can see here, there's a gap and it's still open, whether you can close this gap. But for the uniform coverage or turn-based games, um, we can obtain the matching upper and lower bounds. Um, okay, and uh, for uh, the Markov setting or the reinforced learning setting, uh, I don't think I have time to go over all the details, but basically it's similar to the single agent setting. You do some uh, dynamic programming, add some uh, bonus to characterize uncertainty. And again, you obtain both upper and lower bounds for each state uh, action tuples. Um, and then you compute Q functions, V function, and what you output, again, it's an asymmetric output for both players. And uh, here, uh, the most technical part is how do we design the bonus? Here, we use a reference function and Bernstein bond to obtain a tight uh, bonus, uh, to, or at least to get a tight dependency on the H factor, the horizon factor. But our dependency on A and B are still uh, not tight for um, this setting. But again, for the uniform coverage and um, uh, turn-based game, we have a matching upper and lower bounds. So again, this also shows that uh, this unilateral assumption is sufficient for uh, the small curve games. Okay, so uh, in summary, um, so we gave kind of this first theoretical study on when it's possible to learn um, um, this um, Nash equilibrium, the offline setting. And the key I take away is that the single policy coverage is not sufficient. So this is kind of a separation between the single agent setting and the two pair zero sum setting. And we propose this unilateral coverage assumption, which is sufficient and cannot be vacant. Uh, and the algorithm is from pessimism for both players. And uh, uh, sometimes we can obtain optimal bounds and sometimes uh, still a polynomial uh, gap. Uh, also mentioned that there's a concurrent work um, with some authors from uh, Berkeley as well, uh, like Joran. Uh, they also study uh, the same setting and also uh, study the uh, linear uh, MDP setting as well. So uh, some open problems, uh, whether we can improve this um, uh, dependency on A and B, that's one uh, natural assumption, uh, natural question. Another question is whether we can generalize this kind of assumption and of course some ideas to multi-agent settings. And uh, we have an upcoming work uh, working on these directions and uh, we'll release it maybe a couple of weeks later. And uh, thank you. And I would like to take uh, some questions. Thank you very much, Simon, for a very interesting talk. Um, do we have any questions in the room? Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, Simon. Thank you for a very nice talk. I'm wondering for the algorithm, because in the online setting, when, when we do Markov games, we usually just, just compute one upper bound and one lower bound, and we do the like uh, Nash equilibrium with upper bounds and a lower bound together. But it seems like you are doing Nash equilibrium for the for the lower bound, lower bound, or um, basically just you know we have you just run uh, this algorithm twice. You can obtain a lower bound. Uh, for this reward and then compute Nash equilibrium. Um, and then you compute the upper bound and you compute Nash equilibrium. And then you output, it's uh, one from the upper bound and one from the lower yeah, bound. I, yeah, what I'm seeing is like, uh, I think in the online setting, we, what we typically do is like, we combine our upper bounds and our lower bounds and we compute the Nash equilibrium for that general sum game. Yeah, I'm yeah. wondering if I'm wondering if something like, like, like that would work or, or that would not work. Um, that may work. But um, here is 
I think this our version, like at least in the offline version, offline setting, is uh, you can use a simple algorithm because you only need to compute the uh, zero sum game. You don't need to compute the general sum game. Um, so that somehow uh, okay. so, uh, offline setting simple. makes it simpler. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So this. Uh, thanks, Simon. So one question uh, generally, what is uh, the setting where you imagine you'll have players playing like uh, randomly and you have data, offline data of this form, um, where you also uh, do active, uh, active experimentation? So you're asking uh, when, uh, like how this data is generated or yeah, when, um, uh, like what? Yeah, uh, like maybe maybe you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, forgot like like the practical scenarios where you have offline data, people not playing, and as equilibrium or some other equilibrium notion. Yeah. Uh, um, and not having the ability of active experimentation. Um. Oh, you mean in what practical applications you may have this kind of? Uh... Like in the game applications, you can actively experiment, so it's not offline, right? So. Ah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's right. In some investment setting, um, I mean, of course, it's based on some assumptions. You do not want to really interact uh, with the environment. And in some uh, recommendation system, uh, some time you can also model it as a game. And where you, uh, can, you, know, you know, interacting it online is uh, kind of costly. So you do want to use some uh, offline data. Yeah, I agree. In games, you do have uh, ability to uh, you know, you have a simulator, so you can get a lot of data. For example, would you expect if people do some uh, no regret learning or something, some other form of learning that's natural, that your uh, coverage criterion will be satisfied? Uh, so you mean when this uh, condition will be satisfied? Yeah, so if you have some form of learning players, when you collect data from learning agents that use some form of uh, learning algorithm, would your coverage be satisfied? Uh, that's a good question. So for, I'm not sure about no re uh, regret learning, whether it can generate data set that satisfies our assumption. Uh, but one simple example is that if you, uh, you know, both player play the actions uniformly, r randomly, then you can have a data set like satisfy our assumption. Uh, all right, so um, I have one question. So um, if yeah. like, um, what is, what would be a generalization of uh, this coverage to, you know, like infinite action spaces and stuff like that? Like if, if, oh, okay. either in single RL or, or like, or, you know, just, um, just yeah. not even do just normal form, like single shot game. Uh, for example, in the linear setting, what you need is a kind of a, a least angular value of the coherence matrix collected by uh, defined on your feature space. That's what people use for linear setting. Uh, for more general, if you have a feature space, uh, for more general setting, uh, I'm not sure. I think there, sometimes people still use this kind of density ratio to, or this uh, yeah, density ratio to define the uh, coverage. All right, thank you. So uh, let's, you know, in the interest of time, let's take further questions offline. Thank you, Simon, uh, for your excellent talk. Uh, and next up, we have uh, Sylvain. Sylvain, you want to start? 